Tech TV US Canada brings you news and views from White House and State Department. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you all. Uh, I want to start today uh, talking about uh, multilateralism. The Trump administration wants multilateral institutions to function, to actually work. Uh, but multilateralism, just for the sake of it, just to get together in a room and chat, doesn't add value. That brings me to the International Criminal Court a thoroughly broken and corrupted institution. The United States has never ratified the Rome Statute that created the court, and we will not tolerate its illegitimate attempts to subject Americans to its jurisdiction. In June, the Trump administration authorized the imposition of economic sanctions against foreign persons directly engaged in ICC efforts to investigate U.S. or allied personnel and those who materially assisted in, those in, the, in that effort. Today we take the next step, because the ICC continues to target Americans, sadly. Pursuant to Executive Order 13928, the United States will designate ICC Prosecutor Fatou Ben Souda and the ICC's Head of Jurisdiction Complementarian Cooperation Division, Fakiso Mochichuko, for having material assisted Prosecutor Ben Souda. Individuals and entities that continue to materially support those individuals risk exposure to sanctions as well. Additionally, State Department has restricted the issuance of visas for certain individuals involved in the ICC's efforts to investigate U.S. personnel. On the multilateral front further, I look forward to seeing my ASEAN Indo-Pacific counterparts next week at a host of virtual meetings. We'll have discussions that will be wide-ranging, including on COVID, North Korea, South China Sea, Hong Kong, and Burma's Rakhine State. I'll also raise how the Trump administration is restoring reciprocity to the U.S.-China relationship. And today we continue that necessary work. For years, the Chinese Communist Party has imposed significant barriers on American diplomats working inside the PRC. Specifically, the Chinese Communist Party has implemented a system of opaque approval processes designed to prevent American diplomats from conducting regular business, attending events, securing meetings, and connecting with the Chinese people, especially on university campuses and via the press and social media. Today, I'm announcing the State Department has established a mechanism requiring approval for senior Chinese diplomats in the United States to visit university campuses and to meet with local government officials. Cultural events with groups larger than 50 people hosted by the Chinese Embassy and consular posts outside our mission properties will also require our approval. Additionally, we're taking further steps to ensure that all official PRC, embassy, and consular social media accounts are properly identified as government accounts, Chinese government accounts. I have David Stilwell, our Assistant Secretary of East Asia Pacific Affairs with me today. He'll take questions. We're simply demanding reciprocity. Access for our diplomats in China should be reflective of the access that Chinese diplomats in the United States have and today's steps will move us substantially in that direction. Further on China, Under Secretary Kroc sent a letter recently to the governing boards of American universities, alerting them to the threats the Chinese Communist Party poses to academic freedom, to human rights, and to university endowments. These threats can come in the form of illicit funding for research, intellectual property theft, intimidation of foreign students, and opaque talent recruitment efforts. University governing boards can help ensure their institutions have clean investments and clean endowment funds by taking a few key steps. Disclose all PRC companies investment in, invested in endowment funds, especially those in emerging market index funds. Divest from Chinese companies on the Commerce Department entity list that are contributing to human rights violations, military coercion, and other abuses and simply understand the recommendations issued by the President's Working Group on Financial Markets, which examined the risk to investors of Chinese companies that are listed on U.S. stock exchanges. Staying on China but moving beyond our borders, we're hoping for a peaceful resolution of the situation on the India-China border. From the Taiwan Strait to the Himalayas and beyond, the Chinese Communist Party is engaged in a clear and intensifying pattern of bullying its neighbors. That bullying is also evident in the South China Sea. Last week, the United States imposed sanctions and visa restrictions on Chinese individuals and entities responsible for the CCP's imperialism there. 
doing things such as unlawful energy surveillance activities in the economic zones for ally the Philippines and other countries. We also remain concerned, we've talked about this before, the activities of more than 300 Chinese flagged vessels near the Galapagos, which are almost certainly engaged in illegal fishing. In light of this maritime lawlessness, it's no surprise that Beijing's candidate in the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea election last week received more abstentions than any other candidate. China is the most flagrant violator of the Law of the Sea Convention, and nations all across the world are registering their disapproval. We're also concerned about Chinese actions in Tibet in light of the General Secretary's recent calls to synthesize Tibetan Buddhism and fight splitism there. We continue to call upon Beijing to enter into dialogue with the Dalai Lama or his representatives without preconditions to reach a settlement that resolves their differences. We're also tracking the situation in Belarus closely. Deputy Secretary Began traveled there uh, last week at my direction. Uh, Belarusians deserve the right to choose their own leaders through a truly free and fair election under independent observation. We demand an immediate end to the violence against them and the release of all who are unjustly detained, and that includes U.S. citizen Vitaly Shirishikov. We're closely coordinating, too, with our transatlantic partners and are together reviewing significant targeted sanctions on anyone involved in human rights abuses and oppression. Turning to the Middle East, where I just got back from a productive trip and where we have senior officials there today. The region is changing rapidly thanks to President Trump's leadership building up ties between Israel and its neighbors. The Abraham Accords are clear proof of just that. So is the first ever direct flight from Tel Aviv to Abu Dhabi, which took place this week, and the first direct flight between Israel and Sudan, which I was honored to make during my trip. Additionally, at every stop, I urge my counterparts to stand united against the Islamic Republic of Iran's threats to the region, which leads to my next point. Forty years ago, 40 years ago this month, the Iranian regime arrested nine members of the Baha'i National Spiritual Assembly of Iran. No one has heard from them since. Sadly, we must conclude that these nine individuals met the same fate as the more than 200 other Iranian Baha'is who, who have been executed for peace of, peacefully practicing their faith. We ask the international community, when will Iran's regime be held accountable for those crimes? In Africa, we welcome the news that Sudan's civilian-led transitional government initiated a historic peace agreement with several opposition groups. That's good news. They suggested to me when I was visiting them that would likely occur. Good on them. And here close at home in the Western Hemisphere, the United States candidate Mauricio Claver Caron is the right person for the presidency of the International Development Bank. The vote, currently scheduled for September 12th, should not be delayed. It should happen that day. And on Venezuela, 34 countries have now joined the growing list, the growing international consensus in favor of a transitional government. More and more nations know that the fraudulent National Assembly election scheduled, for, scheduled by Maduro for December 6th of this year will neither be fair, fair nor free. And we also call on free and fair elections in Haiti as soon as technically feasible. And with that, I'm happy to take a handful of questions today. Uh, okay, uh, let's start with Vivian. Yeah. Great. Hi. Uh, I wanted to ask you about your decision to address the RNC from Jerusalem. Uh, there was guidelines sent to State Department staff uh, advising against participation in any partisan politics. And so um, what message does that send to the men and women of the State Department? Also, obviously, the House um, Foreign Affairs Committee is, has, has raised this issue as part of its uh, complaint against you. And so if you can address all those issues, please. All I can say in my role as Secretary of State uh, I did this in my personal capacity. All I can say in my role as Secretary of State is the State Department reviewed this, was lawful, and I personally felt it was important that the world hear the message of what this administration has accomplished. Okay, Christine. Thank you. Um, the U.S. government China report, uh, military China report, yes. came out yesterday. Yes, it said that uh, China intends to double its nuclear uh, warheads by, in the next 10 years um, and grow its global and uh, naval presence. Uh, how do you think the U.S. and its allies should respond, and what do you think is the most alarming trend uh, of China's military? So what was in that report yesterday doesn't come to as news to anyone who's been following this issue for uh, the past years. This administration is the first one that has truly called out the Chinese Communist Party for this 
military aggression, this buildup that has undertaken, and then, of course, responded to it. Uh, we've done a number of things. First, the President's put the largest defense budgets in American history in front of Congress, and they've passed it, $700 plus billion dollars. Uh, two years running, so we're making sure that America has the tools it needs to respond to any threat, including threats that emanate from the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, second, on particular pieces of this, uh, I'll give you an example, the, the nuclear weapons. We have implored the Chinese to be part of our strategic dialogue. We've, we've suggested it's in their best strategic interest, it's in our best strategic interest, it's in the world's strategic interest to reduce the risk from these most dangerous weapon systems. And uh, we're in productive conversations with the Russian on this very thing. If the Chinese Communist Party is serious about participating on the global stage and being a nation of size and scale that is part of this community, then it has an obligation. When you build out a nuclear arsenal with the kind of missile testing, more missile tests in China last year than I think all Western nations combined. If you're if you're going to be serious, you have to you have to use those in a way that is consistent with how nations undertake their obligations under the nuclear proliferation treaties, and all those obligations, uh, written, unwritten, signed, and unsigned, and then they should enter in these strategic conversations. Well, we want to make sure that the, the risk of using those weapon systems in particular is diminished, and we, we stand ready to have them join this conversation with the Russians. I hope that they will. Nice. Secretary, um, a deputy to President Erdogan just said that Washington partial lifting of arms sale to Cyprus will agitate the conflict in the eastern of the Mediterranean. How do you respond to that, and how do you assess uh, Turkey's influence in the Middle East? And on Lebanon, sir, if I can, um, the French president just wrapped a visit to Beirut. He met with all political leaders, yet we have Assistant Secretary David Schenker in Beirut, and he did not meet with any political leaders. Is this a message? Um, and are you coordinating with the French on any initiative? So as for Lebanon, we're certainly in close conversations with the French. We shared the same objective. Uh, Ambassador uh, Hale was in Beirut uh, several weeks back now. He met with a number of political leaders. Uh, the objective is the same. Business as usual in Lebanon just is unacceptable. I think President Macron said the same thing. Uh, this, this has to be uh, a government that con conducts significant reforms, real change. It's what the people of Lebanon are demanding. And the United States is going to use its diplomatic presence and its diplomatic capabilities to make sure that we get that outcome. I think the French share that. I think the whole world, frankly, sees the risk. Look, the, the risk stares you in the face. Missile systems, precision guide missions that the Hezbollah holds in the south. Uh, you, we all remember the history of Lebanon. Everybody disarms but Hezbollah. Uh, th this is the challenge that is presented. And so those people who are either part of that or are playing footsie with Hezbollah should know that that's not productive. It's not what the people of Lebanon want, and it's not what the regional security situation demands. So I'm confident that the United States, the French, and all of us who are working there on the ground, both uh, to meet the immediate needs and the result as that, that flowed from the uh, explosion that took place now several weeks back, as well as the longer-term challenges that are presenting Lebanon. We'll all work on it together. And on Turkey? Uh, you, asked, you asked about the decision we made yesterday, or announced yesterday, with respect to Cyprus. It's been a long time coming. Uh, we've been working on this for an awfully long time. Uh, we, we know that this uh, decision was announced in light of uh, heightened tensions in the eastern Mediterranean, but we thought it was the right thing, and so I made the decision we would move forward with it on the timeline that uh, our decision was reached. President Trump's been in conversations with President Erdogan. He's spoken to the Prime Minister in Greece. Uh, we're urging everyone to stand down to reduce tensions and begin to have diplomatic discussions about the conflicts that exist there in the eastern Mediterranean, the security conflicts, the energy resource conflicts, the maritime conflicts. They need to sit down and have conversations about this and resolve this diplomatically. It is not useful to increase military tension in the region. Uh, only, only negative things can flow from that. I'll take, I'll take a couple more. Okay. Uh, thanks, Mr. Hi. Um, how do you justify the U.S. not joining the WHO-led COVAX effort uh, to provide a vaccine globally when more than 170 other countries have joined? There is no nation that has been or will be as deeply committed to delivering vaccines all around the world as the United States of America, the, not just in terms of dollars. We will dwarf every nation in terms of the financial resources, the goodness of the American people uh, to give our money to make sure that these vaccines are delivered all around. No nation will match us. It will, won't even be close. Uh, but it is also imperative that when we do that, 
we need to do, do so in a way that's effective. It's not political, that it's science-based. And what we have seen demonstrated from the World Health Organization that it is not that. Yes, uh, it's a question on Mexico. Uh, U.S. energy groups have written letters to you and others in the administration expressing concerns about developments in the energy sector in Mexico. They complain about the lack of legal certainty, investors' rights for U.S. companies in Mexico, uh, taken uh, by actions taken by the Mexican government. What is the Trump administration willing to do to defend U.S. interests in Mexico in the energy sector? And has this been recent to the presidential level? You know, most importantly, I'm familiar with this issue. We, we want American companies to have the opportunity to invest out of Mexico. It's what the USMCA was designed to achieve. We think there's been real progress there. <clears throat> but make, make no mistake, we've been clear. Uh, this isn't about, you, you talked about what we do to defend American interests down there. This is in Mexico's best interest. <laughs> it's in Mexico's best interest to have American investment, the technology that is brought to develop Mexican energy resources to benefit the people of Mexico. And so we're in constant conversations with the Mexican government about this, certainly uh, at every level of the United States government. It's, it's important. We think this cooperative set of agreements that was reached between the United States, Canada, and Mexico can deliver on those outcomes in a way that NAFTA never could. And so we'll continue to work on that challenge. Thank you, Thank you all. Have a wonderful day. We'll keep still on here for a minute, like to say. Thank you, David. I appreciate it.